So now we're looking briefly at Three Pages by Ted Berrigan. Who, who likes this poem? What was your reaction to this poem? Amaris, you're nodding. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Why do you like it? Um, I like that it played with the capitalization and it's a new take on the O'Hara sort of I do this, I do that list poem that we saw before. Mm -hmm. um, and it gave me a lot to think about. I think you can return to it with a new reading each time. Um, lunch poems is in there. It's, it's probably part of his list. He reads, he has lunch, he writes poems. But lunch poems for, it seems to almost be a reference to O'Hara, yeah? Yeah, it could be read in two ways because of the sort of extended gap between the words. It could be either three items. I chose to read it as one mm -hmm. um, in that read sense. Read lunch poems, meaning read O'Hara right. and get my inspiration. Okay. Uh, Dave, you liked it too, I think. Yeah, I loved it. The thing I liked most about it was how unapologetic it is about his choice of lifestyle, which is uh, unconventional. He doesn't have a conventional job, and he doesn't care what anybody else thinks of it. Mm -hmm. So it's as strident in a way as Niedeker, uh, no layoff from this condensory. Um, and there she's answering the patriarch in her world, namely the grandfather who expects her to get a job. <coughs> and um, it's probably just as powerful as Emily's for occupation this. This is the job that I do. But it adds something to it. What would you say it adds to it, Dave? Beyond those other things. In addition to the humor? Well, in addition to the stridency of Niedeker and the power. Oh, yeah, it adds humor to it. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I feel like the first stanza is him saying what other people probably think he does as a jobless guy, uh, just sort of doing it sort of satirically. But, but he yeah. actually does those things. <laughs> Berrigan, fam famously, yeah. Play really, poker, drink yeah, beer, smoke pot, jack off, curse. I mean, it's all those countercultural things. Yeah, but he doesn't do them every day, I don't think. Uh, he could. Uh, he could. Uh, <laughs> you know what, Dave? <laughs> maybe you only do that once a week, but. Um, he also <laughs> points out the uh, other lifestyles that he's rejecting at the end. Yeah, he does. So it. It tends to be not simply an affirmation of the condensory. You know, this is, I can't be laid off. This is what I do. Uh, for occupation, this, the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. Very positive ending there. Although, you know, it's, it's, it's Emily taking her narrow, you know, that false modesty of them, the most powerful person I know, Emily Dickinson, falsely, modestly saying, I have little narrow hands. And then what am I gathering? Oh, just paradise, you know. Um, <laughs> There's no mo false modesty or any kind of modesty at all in Ted Berrigan. Yeah, if I were to say that the first generation of New York poet is epitomized by Ashbery, um, I, I could say O'Hara too, but there's a certain greater wildness. And in order to make a nice bonerism, I'll say Ashbery. And the second generation is characterized by Berrigan. How would you describe, characterize the differences? It's a tough question, and it's not meant to be encyclopedic. It's just an impression. Now, Maurice, what are the, some of the differences? I mean, what immediately jumps out to me is the form of the poem. Um, I don't know if this is typical to Logan's work, but I believe it is. That's sort of Wider open in terms of its form, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, yeah. Anyway. It seems to be more of, a, more of a collage type poem, sort of like putting a, a bunch of different things together. Nice. More collage by a long shot. Yeah. That's good. Anybody else want to add something to it? But it still has some of the basic elements of the New York School of Poet. And what's that? We said it at the beginning. Kind of daily life sort of things. Daily you know, life. I do this. I do this. I do that. List. Let's talk about the list poem. What are some of the qualities, Molly, of the list poem? Uh, parataxis. Mm -hmm. List is just a list and it's unordered, probably, and so unsubordinated. So a non-narrative, or would it be anti-narrative? I think this is non-narrative, yeah. But. And having them all occupy the same space in the poem doesn't assign any greater weight to one or the other. Right. Mm -hmm. What else does a list do? So it calls back to Whitman, how he would just keep enumerating things. Enumerations, mm -hmm. um, In this case, we have 10 things that he does, and no matter how you parse it, it doesn't seem to add up to 10. What, is the, what does that signify? I felt like the tenth thing was the, the writing of the actual poem, because there are nine things that he does externally to this, but ten is composition. Yeah, that's nice. I think that's right. But let's, let's just say that it's not easy to find the ten. 
you read a poem that begins 10 things I do every day, you typically are looking for 10 things. And the fact that you don't get 10 easy things tells you what. Next. Hmm. Well, we, we get the first five very easily. And then after that, it gets muddier. Yeah, it gets so what's, muddier. It's, what's, it's what in general do you conclude from a poet who would tell you, these are the 10 things I do every day, and then it doesn't quite well, work he's, out? He's not being truthful. That there's well, he's, and he's telling you, stop looking for 10 things. Just read the poem. <laughs> yeah, why are you such a nitwit? I say 10 <laughs> things I do every day. You don't expect... The guy, a guy like me to give you all 10. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I'm too busy drinking beer, smoking pot, and these other things. And I'm not going to give you what you want. Why? Up, just read the poem. Yeah, just read the poem. There's so, also a bit of a swerving splinter, I think, just in that. Um, what swerves him? Well, I'm not exactly sure what swerves him, but at the end... The not enough, that seems to be the point, first of all, you know, it's one of the things um, in capitals, but not it's enough. also not enough. It's not like, oh, but oops, I forgot to add the, you know, it's very... Oh, not um, enough might be a, a way of saying I didn't do all 10. Right, but it's <laughs> not a, whoops, it's like a, right, I didn't do all 10. Um, so that, become, that not enough becomes more important than completing what he supposedly set up to do. More conventionally, a read, that's a nice reading of Not Enough. More conventionally, it follows from that list of four that Dave was referring to. The white, dry, and clear, the heart attack, Congressional Medal of Honor, and a house in the country. Those are things, certainly the second, third, and fourth are things that describe a life of conformity, an American life of conformity. The first one is not so clear, but it seems to refer to the boredom of waiting for the paint to dry. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, assuming those four things refer to conformity of the sort he's not interested, Dave, not enough means what? That's not the lifestyle he wants. It's not what I want. Does the New York, the question is, it's not really an answerable question, but I'll pose it, you don't have to answer it. Does the New York school aesthetic um, lead, to, lead emphatically enough to not enough? Is it is it as resistant as it could be? And I think the answer is yes. But here's a way in which Berrigan, second generation New York school, borrows some of the beat sensibility, shares a sense of resistance to conformity that you see in Ginsburg in particular. Um, and yet, because of the, his interest in the list, in the I do this, I do that, um, in, the, in the frank formalism of the poem, um, he's very much a, a New York school. Max, I'm going to give you the final word on this. One last thing that we didn't say. It's to, to go back to the comparison we're making with with uh, Niedecker, um This this sort of occupation that he's choosing. It seems almost. He seems almost to say that he doesn't have a choice. That no help wanted there seems to say there's no jobs. It's not that it's not that I, you know, could have this job um, as grandfather advises me to, but rather I choose this job. He's saying like, I walk around all day, I play poker and I drink and I do nothing and I write poems because there's no help wanted. There's nothing for for me at this point now that everyone has their their white picket fences and everyone has that life, that life's already been claimed. There's nothing for And them. also, I like that, Max, thank you. And also, uh, I don't need help with my vices. My vices are elemental, <laughs> elemental. No help wanted, I don't need your help. There's something about Emersonian self-reliance here, and I can't help but think that the reference to Moby Dick points us in that direction. Mm. This is a kind of American self-reliance. This, this is what happens to Emerson when you get to the 1960s and 70s.